Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Today, Dan Novak tells us about a possible ban on TikTok in the United States. Later, Faith Perlo and Jill Robbins present a new everyday grammar report. We close the show with the next part of our U.S. history series. But first, here is Dan Novak. The administration of U.S. President Joe Biden. Has demanded that TikTok's Chinese owners sell their share of the company or face a U.S. ban. The company told Reuters Wednesday. The move is the strongest in a series of recent steps against the company by U.S. officials and lawmakers. American officials have raised fears that TikTok's U.S. user data. Could be passed on to China's government. There is also concern that pro-Chinese propaganda could be pushed through the app. TikTok remains very popular and is used by two thirds of teenagers in the United States. Wang Wenbin is China's foreign ministry spokesperson. He told reporters. That the U.S. has not presented evidence that TikTok threatens American national security. He also said the U.S. was using the excuse of data security to suppress foreign companies. ByteDance, which owns TikTok, confirmed that 60 percent of its shares are owned by foreign investors. It is the first time Biden, a Democrat, Has threatened to ban TikTok. Former President Republican Donald Trump tried to ban TikTok in 2020, but the move was blocked by U.S. courts. Brooke Oberwetter is a TikTok spokesperson. She told Reuters the company had recently heard about the possible ban from the U.S. Treasury-led Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. Or CFIUS. CFIUS is a powerful national security body. It had recommended in 2020 that ByteDance sell TikTok. Under pressure from then President Trump, ByteDance unsuccessfully tried to sell TikTok to Walmart and Oracle in late 2020. TikTok head Xu Zichu. Is set to appear before the U.S. Congress next week. It is not clear whether the Chinese government would approve any sale or divestment. Last month, the White House gave government agencies 30 days to remove TikTok from federal devices and systems. More than 30 U.S. states. Have also banned employees from using TikTok on government-owned devices. On Thursday, Britain's government announced that TikTok is banned from government devices effective immediately. Any U.S. ban could face large legal blocks and also have possible political effects. Last week, Democratic Senator Mark Warner said it was important the U.S. government do more. To explain the national security risks from TikTok, TikTok and Cifius have been negotiating for more than two years on data security requirements. TikTok said it has spent more than 1.5 billion dollars on data security efforts and rejects spying accusations. Last week, the White House backed legislation. To give the administration new powers to ban TikTok and other foreign-based technologies if they threaten national security, that could give the Biden administration more strength in court if it bans TikTok. 
China has long been concerned about foreign social media and communications apps. It bans most of the best known ones, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. I'm Dan Novak. In the past few weeks, we asked readers and listeners to write structured poems using either parts of speech or syllables. Many of you wrote in with sin canes, haiku, and diamond poems. In this week's everyday grammar, we will read some of your poems. Tao wrote a sin cane poem with parts of speech. Let's take a look. Summer, warmer, dry, bright, lighting, heating. Cuddling, waiting for the raindrops, passion. Tao's subject is summer, which is his one-word noun. The second line has three adjectives that describe the season. This line should only have two adjectives, but it is okay. The poem is still a sinkane with five lines. Next, Tao moves on to the third line with three ing verbs. The fourth line uses the phrase "waiting for the raindrops." This line describes Tao's feelings about summer and the longing for relief from the warm weather. And in the last line, Tao uses the word "passion." Which is a strong emotion of love, and considers his thoughts about summer. Wonderful job, Tao. Our next two poems come from Francis and Muhammad. They both wrote diamond poems. Let's start with Francis's poem. Mother, gentle, kind. Caring, loving, understanding. Sister, daughter, auntie, wife. Worrying, crying, protecting. Sweet, beautiful woman. Francis wrote about a mother. He used four adjectives. Two in the second line and two in the sixth line: gentle, kind, sweet, and beautiful. In the third and fifth lines, he used six ing verbs. While the two lines describe the subject mother, there is a change in the fifth line to more powerful images of crying, worrying, and protecting. The fourth line includes other nouns and parts the subject might play. Lastly, Francis ends his lovely sinkane with woman. Francis created his sinkane with synonyms, words with similar meanings. Now let's read one with antonyms, words with opposing meanings that Muhammad sent in. Teacher, kind, caring, teaching. Perspiring, inspiring. Notebooks, books, chalk, duster. Advising, leading, bearing. Disrespectful, unruly, student. In his diamond poem, Mohammed starts with teacher as his subject, and ends with student. He describes a teacher as kind and caring. Then he compares a teacher to a student, using adjectives in the seventh line, like disrespectful and unruly. Those negative adjectives are a smart choice for the antonym poem. There is one word we would like to give feedback on: perspiring. It means to sweat when our bodies work hard. I will admit teaching is a physical activity, and we do sweat as teachers. 
Another word we could use is enduring, which means working hard over a long period of time. Such a fun poem, Mohammed. Lastly, we have two poems using syllables from Jack. One is a haiku with seventeen syllables, and another is a sin cane with twenty-two syllables. Let's start with Jack's haiku. We were always doomed. I will never understand. Inevitable. Jack uses powerful words like. Doomed and inevitable. All the words fit the syllable structure of the haiku, with five syllables in the first line, seven in the second line, and five again in the last line. Here is Jack's sinking. Gray sky, shepherd's delight. The blue sky is tranquil. A natural phenomenon. Look up. All of Jack's words fit the structure of a sinking with syllables. Gray sky, two syllables. Shepherd's delight, four syllables. The blue sky is tranquil, six syllables. A natural phenomenon, eight syllables. Look up. Two syllables. There is a connection to the common saying, "Red sky at night, shepherd's delight." It means that if there is a bright red sky in the evening, the following day will bring good weather. Instead of red, Jack chose gray, followed by blue sky. We know that once gray skies clear, blue skies and sunny days will follow. Jack ends with a request: "Look up." The mood of this poem is very peaceful, and your word choices fit the syllables. Thank you, Jack. In today's report, we read structured poems from our listeners. You chose subjects like summer, sky, mother, and teacher. You chose words that fit poem structures. Parts of speech and syllables. Your poems were filled with emotion and descriptive images. We hoped that you have enjoyed learning about ways to create poetry in English, and we thank all of you who sent us your good work. You just heard Faith Perlo and Jill Robbins present this week's Everyday Grammar Report. Faith is here now to talk a bit more about the poems. Welcome back, Faith. Thanks for having me back. This week was the third week of talking about poetry. Some of our readers and listeners submitted their own work. Yes, we had some amazing poetry this week. All of our readers and listeners wrote some very strong haiku and sinkanes. I had a question about one of the phrases I heard you use. Can you tell us more about the phrase "red skies, shepherd's delight"? This is a common proverb or saying that is used to predict the weather. If the sky is red in the morning, that may mean that bad weather is on its way. But if we see a red sky at night, sailors or shepherd's delight, that means that good weather. Will happen the following day. Is there some science behind it? Sort of. It has to do with high and low pressure systems with the weather. If there is a high pressure system, which is typically fair weather, dust particles will collect and clear out towards the east. The red color we see is light from the sun moving through those little dust particles. In the atmosphere, then a low pressure system will come in, and low pressure systems can be like a cold front or rain. So, depending on if this happens in the morning or at night, is where the proverb comes in. So, if this red sky happens in the morning, 
the high pressure system is moving out and bad weather may happen during the rest of the day. But if we see a red sky at night, then that low pressure will happen overnight and by the morning we may have better weather because of another high pressure system. Exactly, Ashley. Well, thanks for sharing that with us, Faith. Talk to you next week, Ashley. American History in VOA Special English. On November 11th, 1918, a truce was signed ending the hostilities of World War I. The Central Powers, led by Germany, had lost. The Allies, led by Britain, France, and the United States, had won. The war lasted four years. It took the lives of 10 million people. It left much of Europe in ruins. It was described as the war to end all wars. Barbara Klein and Doug Johnson tell about President Woodrow Wilson and his part in events after the war. The immediate task was to seek agreement on terms of a peace treaty. The Allies were filled with bitter anger. They demanded a treaty that would punish Germany severely. They wanted to make Germany weak by destroying its military and industry. And they wanted to ruin Germany's economy by making it pay all war damages. Germany, they said, must never go to war again. President Woodrow Wilson of the United States did not agree completely with the other allies. He wanted a peace treaty based on justice, not bitterness. He believed that would produce a lasting peace. President Wilson had led negotiations for a truce to end the hostilities of World War I. Now he hoped to play a major part in negotiations for a peace treaty. To be effective, he needed the full support of the American people. Americans had supported Wilson's policies through most of the war. They had accepted what was necessary to win. This meant higher taxes and shortages of goods. At the time, Americans seemed to forget party politics. Democrats and Republicans worked together. All that changed when it became clear the war was ending. Congressional elections were to be held in November 1918. President Wilson was a Democrat. He feared that Republicans might gain a majority of seats in Congress. If they did, his negotiating powers at a peace conference in Europe would be weakened. Wilson told the nation, The return of a Republican majority to either House of Congress would be seen by foreign leaders as a rejection of my leadership. Republicans protested. They charged that Wilson's appeal to voters was an insult to every Republican. One party leader said, this is not the president's private war. The Republican campaign succeeded. The party won control of both the Senate and the House of Representatives. The congressional elections were a defeat for President Wilson, but he did not let the situation interfere with his plans for a peace conference. He and the other Allied leaders agreed to meet in Paris in January 1919. In the weeks before the conference, Wilson chose members of his negotiating team. 
everyone expected him to include one or more senators. After all, the Senate would vote to approve or reject the final peace treaty. Wilson refused. Instead, he chose several close advisers to go with him to Paris. Today, American history experts say Wilson's decision was a mistake. Failure to put senators on the negotiating team, they say, cost him valuable support later on. In early December, President Wilson sailed to France. The voyage across the Atlantic Ocean lasted nine days. He arrived at the port of Brest on December 13th. Wilson felt very happy. Thirteen, he said, was his lucky number. French citizens stood along the railroad that carried him from Brest to Paris. They cheered as his train passed. In Paris, cannons were fired to announce his arrival, and a huge crowd welcomed him there. The people shouted his name over and over again, Wilson, Wilson, Wilson. The noise sounded like thunder. French Premier Georges Clemenceau commented on the event. He said, I do not think there has been anything like it in the history of the world. People cheered President Wilson partly to thank America for sending its troops to help fight against Germany. But many French citizens and other Europeans also shared Wilson's desire to establish a new world of peace. They listened with hope as he made an emotional speech about a world in which everyone would reject hatred, a world in which everyone would join together to end war forever. More than 25 nations that helped win the war sent representatives to the peace conference in Paris. All took part in the negotiations. However, the important decisions were made by the so-called Big Four. Prime Minister David Lloyd George of Britain, Premier Georges Clemenceau of France, Premier Vittorio Orlando of Italy, and President Woodrow Wilson of the United States. Wilson hoped the other Allied leaders would accept his plan for a new international organization. The organization would be called the League of Nations. Wilson believed the League could prevent future wars by deciding fair settlements of disputes between nations. He believed it would be the world's only hope for a lasting peace. Most of the other representatives did not have Wilson's faith in the power of peace. Yet they supported his plan for the League of Nations— However, they considered it less important than completing a peace treaty with Germany, and they did not want to spend much time talking about it. They feared that negotiations on the League might delay the treaty and the rebuilding of Europe. Wilson was firm. He demanded that the peace treaty also establish the League, so he led a group at the conference that wrote a plan for the operation of the League. He gave the plan to the European leaders to consider. Then he returned to the United States for a brief visit. President Wilson soon learned that opposition to the League of Nations existed on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. 
many Americans opposed it strongly. Some Republican senators began criticizing it even before Wilson's ship reached the port of Boston. The senators said the plan failed to recognize America's long-term interests. They said it would take away too many powers from national governments. Thirty-seven senators signed a resolution saying the United States should reject the plan for the League of Nations. That was more than the number of votes needed to defeat a peace treaty to which Wilson hoped the League plan would be linked. The Senate resolution hurt Wilson politically. It was a sign to the rest of the world that he did not have the full support of his people. But he returned to Paris anyway. He got more bad news when he arrived. Wilson's top advisor at the Paris Peace Conference was Colonel Edward House. Colonel House had continued negotiations while Wilson was back in the United States. House agreed with Wilson on most issues. Unlike Wilson, however, he believed the Allies' most urgent need was to reach agreement on a peace treaty with Germany. To do this, House was willing to make many more compromises than Wilson on details for the League of Nations. Wilson was furious when he learned what House had done. He said, Colonel House has given away everything I had won before I left Paris. He has compromised until nothing remains. Now I have to start all over again. This time it will be more difficult. For Woodrow Wilson, the most difficult negotiations still lay ahead. 